Next, I have the uh, distinct pleasure to introduce um, Olivia Block, who um, has, uh, over the past 30 years, forged an influential career in experimental music and sound installation. In addition to a discography of over 20 solo and collaborative recordings, Block has performed and exhibited around the world, including installations and premieres in Europe, North America, and Asia, at venues such as the Institute of Contemporary Art London, Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, the Museo Nacional Centro de Arte Reina Sofia in Madrid, and La Biennale di Venezia, 52nd International Festival of Contemporary Music. She's worked directly with Bertoia Sounding Sculptures on two occasions uh, for the work Sunambient Pavilion, which was performed in Chicago's Pritzker Pavilion in 2015, and for her sightings installation here at the Nasher Sculpture Center, The Speed of Sound and Infinite Copper, which is on view right now upstairs in our corner gallery. So, Olivia. I always have to adjust the mic because I'm so tall, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much, Jed, and thank you so much um, to Marin and Jed for doing this project and for including me. It's just been such a wonderful experience, and anytime I can work with Bertoia sounds, I'm just all about it. They're just beautiful sounds, and they're so much fun to work with. It's like, it's like molding the most amazing, most malleable, fantastic pieces of clay or something, if you're a ceramicist or something like that. So um, I want to talk a little bit about my practice. And then I'm just going to go right into the, to the piece that's here now. Um, my um, practice intersects many points on a line, a continuum line. On one end of that line is sound and media art. And on the other end of that continuum is music. So throughout my history, I've done you know anything from pipe organ concerts in cathedrals with installation speakers kind of embedded in, into the sides of the um, halls of the cathedral to electronic music and then purely just sound art installations. So I'm always kind of going back and forth between modalities and they all kind of inform each other in this amazing, really fun way. So um, as Jed was mentioning, I have a discography that um, spans about 30 years. And the style of music really varies uh, depending on kind of what I'm interested in and curious about in my life at the time. Um, however, there's always a through line of my I guess I, I would say my emotional sensibility that you can kind of recognize in all of the, the sound works. Um, so I was gonna play you a little um, excerpt of a, sound, of a sound piece that I did called Heave Two, which demonstrates something that I try to achieve in my work, um, and that is to kind of interrogate how it, the, the sort of hierarchical ways in which we listen to sound and music um, so in the piece Heave 2, I attempted to create kind of a sound storm in which um, chamber instruments like violins and uh, horns were kind of treated like pieces of debris that were just um, being flown around with these recordings of wind and water and things. So I'm going to hopefully play you a little bit of this piece.
And if you wouldn't mind fading that out in the back. And so that piece kind of goes on until the, the storm sort of subsides, much like a real storm at sea would. Um, and I think maybe one of the reasons that I'm really drawn to um, Bertoia's work, especially um, the Sonambient uh, sculptures, is that they also kind of interrogate the way that you think about things. I mean, for me, it's, it's an interrogation into the way that I think of, of the definition of a sculpture itself and, and including this element of time and the radiation of sound that goes far, far out you know, beyond the, the object itself. So I feel like I can kind of, in my mind, like relate, <coughs> excuse me, relate to the way that Bertoia thought, or at least I think that I can in my fantasy world. Sometimes in um, the presentation of my recorded works, I do things with um, found images. And in this case, um, I had a, an LP come out a few years ago called Dissolution, in which 35 millimeter slides were exploded in the vinyl itself and enclosed in the vinyl, so that was a limited edition. So oftentimes my recordings are, are also artworks, objects of art. I also have a performance practice, which is also very just like my all of the recordings. Um, so you're looking at um, one photograph where I was performing inside piano, which I often do. I put um, objects inside the piano, like broken glass that's balancing on the strings or little pieces of metal or things like that. So i um, very interested in the piano as a resonating board, almost like a sound space, and using different materials to activate the, the reson resonance of the piano. And then the center is just um, a show that I recently did at the Empty Bottle in Chicago. It's more of kind of like a post-rock space um, and that kind of music with synth organs and much louder than, than some of my other work. And then the end photo is in um, the uh, chapel in Chicago. It's just a um, Rockefeller chapel. And this was 132 ranks, which was um, a commission by Lampo organization in Chicago, utilizing the chapel as um, almost like a sound installation and concert at the same time. I also make scores for um, ensembles and orchestra. And um, so on the left, you can um, see that there's a kind of a scribbly score for organ, which was part of a performance for a piano piece that I did, which I can play a little bit of, and I'll just kind of talk over it. This is a solo piano piece in which I am inside the strings, hitting the low strings with a mallet, and then there are some kind of um, interventions that happen, but the, but the score that you're seeing um, on the left is actually the organ part that my partner Adam played in the concert. Um, so I think, again, one of the the ways in which I engage with Bertoia's work is just to think about um, materials and the sounds of materials, and particularly metal. So um, with the piano, I'm always thinking about the metal strings, like the large metal strings, and what kind of overtones I can uh, kind of coax out of that metal. So in this piece, I'm actually like putting my finger on various harmonic points of the string and then very gently like hitting the mallet so that I get the, the harmonic overtones in the f with the fundamental tone. And so I wanted to play this piece because um, one of the things that I find so amazing about the Sonambient sounding sculptures is that the metal alloy that he, so I was like so excited that your book was called Alloys. I was just like, yes. Um, the metal alloys that Bertoia chose for these sculptures have this insane harmonic structure. I mean, just very, very complex, a lot of overtones. And if you're thinking about the sound envelope, which is in music, you think about harmony and melody and rhythm and all of these things. But in sound, you think about the envelope. And that is the way that the shape of the sound forms, the attack and the decay. 
So in these sonambient metal pieces, the decay of each of these sounds is incredibly long. And that's something that's so rare. It's really, it's really fantastic that he found this kind of metal alloy that had this, this, these infinitely long decays. It's almost like the, the sounds never go away. So this is something I always try to achieve inside the piano. Um, so you can actually uh, take this sound sample down. I also do visual work. Um, the piece on the left is from um, some slides in my found slide collection. I often will use two slides layered and take a, a projector and actually like move back and forth between focusing on one and focusing on the other to kind of get a strange um, kind of glitchy weirdness between the two. Then on the right is um, a video that I did for my latest album and single Axiolite. So I think that the, the, the entree for me into multi-speaker sound installation was from my um, multi-speaker sound concerts that I've been doing for many years. And this tradition kind of started in France with um, a lot of radio production people and they started this kind of musical um, kind of genre called musique concrète, which you may have heard of, in which um, composers would take these concrete sounds of things like trains and, and other sounds from like the radio libraries or things that they themselves recorded and they would kind of put those together in collage works and collage sound works. So often I will do take that approach in my surround sound concerts um, and usually the way that, that the um, setup is is kind of like how you all are right now except for imagine that this room would be completely dark with maybe eight anywhere from eight to 16 speakers surrounding us all and I would probably be like right in the middle of you with a mixing desk and actually like mixing all of these sounds that I kind of have on software and mixing them live and kind of um, responding to the way that the room is interacting with the sounds and sending them all over the place in different speakers. So given that I have been doing that kind of work for so long, it, it's pretty natural for me to start thinking about using um, multiple speakers in a space that I am not in all the time and thinking about just how the room is, is speaking through sound. Um, so I also have an installation practice. Many of my installations are very research-based. They take a long time. A lot of them are very site-specific um, and actually not in gallery spaces. Um, but it's interesting because I actually feel like this installation for the Bertoya retrospective is almost like a site-specific piece simply because it's so much about Bertoya as an artist and his life. So I, I kind of approached this piece the way that I would um, for a site-specific pe piece, which is to really think about not only the space, but the history, his life, his work, what he might have wanted to be, like if he had the technology we have now, like what would he have wanted? I was thinking a lot about that. So a lot of times when I do multiple channel installations, the speakers that I use are not always large speakers. Sometimes they're really small. And sometimes they're placed inside objects which have their own kind of filtering, cap like, you know, capacity. So for instance, on the, um, the lower right corner, I did a piece um, for the University of Chicago campus and all the buildings there are made of limestone. So I took recordings in a limestone cave of all this water dripping um, in the location where the limestone was sourced for the buildings. And then I used several kind of cast off pieces from the University of Chicago ca campus, had them um, kind of hollowed out and put speakers in them and then they were on site like in this sort of outdoor like narrow space that goes down which is almost kind of like a cave like space. And then the top piece was in St. Augustine, Florida where I took a lot of recordings of um, oyster beds and hearing the oysters kind of like they, they were trying to restore this oyster reef. And so I was thinking about a lot about like animal kind of hearing and what it must be like to be an oyster and used a lot of these, um, these oyster reef houses that, that are made for oy or oysters to kind of like latch onto. 
Um, and so the speakers were placed inside those, those oyster houses and the sounds of the oysters were kind of like singing through those objects. Lower left is um, a piece that I did at, um, in Poland at a sanitarium that was, that was in the, the book, The Magic Mountain, if anyone's ever read that. So it was like this historical place. It was very dilapida dilapidated. So I used all medical kind of um, historical materials. Like this is the uh, curtains are made of gauze. I'm looking at this, but it's the same thing as that. So I'm pointing, it's very confusing, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's curtains that are made of gauze, which were kind of activated by the wind. And then there were multiple speakers all around of people um, kind of breathing, just the white noise of breath, because of course I was thinking about the history of this space and the people who had tuberculosis and all of the lung problems that they were having. Um, so this piece, an ambient pavilion in 2015, um, was kind of like the precursor to the piece that I am doing here now at the Nasher. Um, so I was, it's really fun to hear everybody talk about Pertoya because I think we're all drawn to him and we think that we discovered something because we realized that he's just not nearly well known enough. And I had that experience in Chicago where I, you know, came across the, um, Sinambient sounding sculptures, which were originally part of the Standard Oil Commission, but had, but had been kind of broken up, are now downtown at the Aeon Center. You can kind of see on the, oh, <laughs> on the top right um, at the Aeon Center. Yeah, um, so, but at the time, on, in the photo here, this is actually in pretty good shape. When I came upon this Sinambian, it was actually kind of not in such great shape. It, um, yeah, it was kind of like there was a rod missing and it just was like, oh no, why is this? Uh, there's so much, you know, amazing public art in Chicago and it's really well um, taken care of, but why is this not on that level? It's just as good, if not, I'm better in my position. I, I love the sound stuff. So um, yeah, so I was just kind of like, well this, I, I had this idea that I wanted to take the sounds of this, um, this particular Sinambient sculpture and kind of diffuse them through this gigantic kind of speaker trellis that you can see um, there um, in Millennium Park, Chicago. And the speaker trellis was originally used to just amplify the concerts that were in the Gary band shell. Um, and the lawn that you see is for people to kind of like spread out, put their picnic blankets down and listen to the concert. And so the speaker trellis goes over their heads and um, all of these, I think there's like 64 speakers or something like that, is just kind of gently amplifying what's happening on the stage. But I wanted to take the sounds from the Bertoya sculptures and just basically break apart that speaker system so that each speaker had a different sound in it. And so with the city and with um, this great organization that I work with a lot, Experimental Sound Studio, we kind of convinced them to change the entire software of the system to break it all apart. And, and so this was kind of like the first large scale sound piece that they had at um, the Pritzker Pavilion. And so, you know, it was like, just imagine kind of walking under a million sounds from one of those um, sonambient sounding sculptures. It was pretty magical. Now that, of course, naturally led me to be just completely all in for this project. Um, and, you know, when Jed and Marin approached me about this and I found out that I would be able to record some more sounding sculptures in a quieter space, I was just thrilled. And so in the beginning before COVID, the actually the design, I knew that I wanted to have an interactive component to this installation. But the original design, and I don't know if you even remember this, Jed, but it was actually, there were going to be objects in the space with wind sensors on them because I'm so aware of how the wind always interacts with these sunambient pieces. So, um, you know, the visitor would walk in, there would be um, this delicate kind of object with a wind sensor, and if you would blow on the sensor, the, the sensor would pick up the wind pressure and then would trigger all these sound events to happen. However, of course, after COVID, we were just like, oh God, that's just not, can you imagine, just imagine that now, like what that would mean, it would be so <laughs> incredibly awful like to have that now, just be, be yeah. So um, naturally, 
changed the whole design. Um, and here's some of the sounds. I forgot that these were on here. But so, um, yeah, I changed the design, and the interactive component is now um, two sensor bars overhead that have, um, you know, ultrasonic sensors that kind of pick up people's physical presence when they're moving underneath these sensor bars. And I, and I took a lot of recordings of the sonambience. I'm actually going to just kind of forward through, because you'll hear these sounds in a sec. Um, so here I'll show you a little video clip of when I was, when we had the sonambience kind of set up almost like in a chamber orchestra formation. And I was kind of activating all of these sculptures. And the gentleman that you see is my friend Alex Inglesian, who's a really great sound engineer who helped me with the recording of this. And so he was kind of helping me activate all of these at once because we wanted to get each individual sonambient, oh, sorry, that was a little awkward, um, each individual sonambient and then the entire ensemble. Um, so we kind of like painstakingly just went through, you can see the uncrating here um, that they were just lovely enough to do all for, for this project and created this, the, all of the Sanambians put them in this formation. And then after doing the, um, the ensemble where we were like just going around with each and every one and getting like the whole sort of, um, the, the loudest possible sound I could get, I went through just like kind of each and every one like mic'd very, very closely to get the quietest sounds I could. So I really wanted to get the range thinking about that, that sound envelope again. I wanted to get all the decays from the loud sound and all of the attacks from the quietest possible way. And you're gonna hear a sound, but I'm gonna just kind of rush through it here. You can hear, so you can see that I'm, I'm miking just one and kind of activating that one at the time. So some of the things that I wanted to think about in this piece is um, I was just kind of um, posing questions to myself and one of those questions was how do I kind of represent this artist um, who is no longer here? This is a retrospective of Bertoia's work and I wanted to not just do a piece that was my piece. I really wanted to do something that both honored Bertoia and kind of um, really showed the possibilities of those sonambient sculptures or sounded them out really. Um, and I was thinking about representing these objects without the objects actually being present. And so I decided that using light, like the shadows and reflections from some of those pieces would also be a, a good way to kind of re represent the, the absence of those objects. So I had um, this, uh, this great collaborator in the technical kind of realm of this, um, Stefan Moore who's been here but had to leave this morning. And I kind of came up with this whole, um, it's almost like going back to my days of scoring for musicians, but in this case, I'm actually scoring for an installation, scoring something out, making instructions. Um, so these diagrams are just the speaker array and where I wanted the sounds, the, tra the trajectory of the sounds, the, the, the way that they're going to travel in the space. This is Stefan Moore. He did a lot of the programming to get the sounds from the sensors into the computer and moving around in the space. So we worked a lot together on that just to get the right kind of feel in the room. And here are my the programming guidelines that I gave to, to Stefan, which again is kind of like almost like scoring something for or making a game for, for this installation. Um, so there's a visual aspect to this piece. I was thinking a lot about the lines that are in the Sanambient sculptures. And so I wanted to represent that through um, the reflection of the moving sculptures. So I took a lot of videos of the moving Sanambient sculptures and then actually projected them onto the floor and the reflections are coming off of the floor. So you don't really see the video itself, you only see the shadows and the reflections, which again kind of emphasizes the fact that actually this person and these objects are not present in the room. I'm not sure why this is glitching and this was doing this before, but, uh, <laughs> but um, 
I really like the way that um, the Sonambians work with light, and I feel like all of Bertoia's work, to me, like the, what grabs me the most is just the way that light shines through these, these pieces. And if you look at um, the, each Sonambian structure, it almost looks like a photographic glitch or something. So it's kind of funny that there was a glitch right then, because because when I look at those um, those kind of tightly arrayed rods, like it almost looks like something like a staggered photograph or something. And so for me, I, I really wanted to bring that into the room too. So this is how I kind of used the videos from the, the sculptures and then projected them onto the floor and kind of experimented with that. So this is kind of fun. Um, I just wanted to close by showing y'all a um, two spectrograms. The one on the right, on this side, is a spectrogram of Oprah talking, who we all know her voice. And then the one on the left is actually one of my recordings of the um, Sonambient sound sculptures. And I wanted to show you that because you can see um, how the how the one of Oprah's voice is so limited. You can see how the frequency range is just in this one band. But then if you look at the, the, the other one, you can see it's just all over the place. And this is what I love about the sounds from these sculptures, is that the frequency range is just is very, very broad. And um, that includes all of these overtones. And you know, at first, I was trying to actually find the resonant frequency of each of the sculptures. But that's impossible to do because um, each rod on each sculpture is ever so slightly longer or shorter than the, than the rest. So the resonant frequency kind of depends on which rod is hitting which other rod at the time. So it was like, I can't even do that. It's so complex, like the movement's so complex and the overtones are so complex with the metal that I can't even find one resonant frequency. So. That's just one of the magical things about his work, is just the, the complexity of the metal sound. So I think I'm in, with that I'm gonna close, and I hope you all can visit the space and move around and enjoy it. Thank you.